Kubernetes is an orchestration system for managing containers. Since it was open sourced by Google, Kubernetes has created a wave of innovation in the infrastructure technology space. Another recent innovation has been the serverless execution tools, such as AWS Lambda and Google Cloud Functions. Serverless execution, otherwise known as functions as a service, allows a developer to execute code against cloud servers without specifying which cloud servers they are executing on. Serverless execution is a cheap and flexible resource that any large company wants to have access to. But AWS Lambda and the other popular serverless tools are closed source, and they're also only accessible if you're on a cloud provider. This led Soam Vasani to work on Fission, a serverless executor that sits on top of Kubernetes. If you've not heard about either Kubernetes or serverless, you can check out our previous episodes about either topic, which are linked to in the show notes. And if you're familiar with both of these topics, I think you'll enjoy this episode in which Soam explains the motivation for serverless on Kubernetes and the architecture of Fission. We're going to do another episode coming soon about Kubeless, which is another one of these serverless on Kubernetes frameworks. And it's interesting to see people build on top of Kubernetes after so much talk of it being the distributed systems version of Linux. It's really showing to be of that level of importance and how it's an important building block that other people are creating tools on top of. Software Engineering Daily is looking for sponsors for Q3. If your company has a product or a service, or if you're hiring, Software Engineering Daily reaches 23,000 developers listening daily, and I would love to hear from you. Send me an email, jeff at softwareengineeringdaily.com. Thanks for listening. Your application sits on layers of dynamic infrastructure and supporting services. Datadog brings you visibility into every part of your infrastructure, plus APM for monitoring your application's performance. Dashboarding, collaboration tools, and alerts let you develop your own workflow for observability and incident response. Datadog integrates seamlessly with all of your apps and systems, from Slack to Amazon Web Services, so you can get visibility in minutes. Go to softwareengineeringdaily.com slash datadog to get started with Datadog and get a free t-shirt. With full observability, distributed tracing, and customizable visualizations, Datadog is loved and trusted by thousands of enterprises, including Salesforce, PagerDuty, and Zendesk. If you haven't tried Datadog at your company or on your side project, go to softwareengineeringdaily.com slash datadog to support Software Engineering Daily and get a free t-shirt. Our deepest thanks to Datadog for being a new sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. It is only with the help of sponsors like you that this show is successful. So thanks again. Soam Vasani is an engineer with Platform 9 Systems. Soam, welcome to Software Engineering Daily. Thank you so much for having me here. Kubernetes is a management platform for containers, and we're going to talk about Kubernetes and talk about serverless. Let's give a little bit of an overview for those who are unfamiliar with Kubernetes. Why is it important? Yeah, so to give some context, I think if you look at you know how people used to deploy software before the the popularity of containers, outside Google at least, there was a lot of language and stack-specific stuff, right? And containers brought this uniformity, whether it's Ruby or Perl or Python or whatever, you can wrap it in a container and that's uniformly deployed everywhere. In fact, that, hence, that, that's why that shipping container analogy was used. So containers solved that uniformity problem, but now you needed to do all this stuff to manage container networking to, it didn't actually solve how you would schedule a container onto a cluster of hosts and things like that. So that's where Kubernetes comes in. And I think it, you can think of it as something that lets you view the cluster as a collection of fungible compute 
nodes. And one way I've seen it explained is that you never SSH into a machine again. You get a cluster level API and you say, take this container image and deploy it somewhere. And it's not just mm -hmm. a container image. There's, you know, all sorts of stuff around it, like how many replicas do you want? How do you want mm -hmm. to expose it to the world? And things like that. How do you want to update it? Yeah. Now, I think you'd agree with me that Kubernetes solved more problems than it introduced, but <laughs> it did make some problems more important to consider. You talked about container networking. Kubernetes solved a lot of the deployment issues that yeah. perhaps Docker hadn't solved, a lot of the centralized management issues. Yeah. What are those other difficulties? What are the newer difficulties that Kubernetes users had to encounter? Oh, that's a good question. Let's see. I think this... We talked about networking. Right. So on a networking level, there's Kubernetes, I think, made a, a good decision, which was all containers are... Well, containers are in pods in the in the Kubernetes world, but all pods are network addressable. And in fact, they initially made this uniformly everything can access everything network space, but more recent versions have had more pluggable systems where you can isolate, where you can have some level of isolation. But to step back from networking a bit, I think one of the, one of the things that at least new Kubernetes users have to figure out is how to, how to take this whole powerful expressive language that Kubernetes gives you and how to apply it to your problem. So, you know, a new user, let's say you've never heard of Kubernetes, now you have to learn at least maybe half a dozen to a dozen concepts before you can start using it. Like you have to know, well, you have to know containers, images, how to create those images, how to host them in a registry somewhere, how to use image tags to manage your versions. And that's just before you start with Kubernetes. Then you need to know what a deployment is. And then you presumably you want to expose this software out to the world somehow. So you need to learn how ingress works and you want to wire up that ingress to your deployment. So you need to learn the concept of labels, which, which is really cool. All of these concepts are, you know, extremely powerful and useful, but I think there's a significant learning curve to, to Kubernetes. And that's one of its big challenges right now, I'd say. Hmm. So it created, I think, it's very complete in a sense, like you can take almost any distributed systems problem and, and express it using Kubernetes, I think. But to learn how to do that takes some time, especially for a new user. And there are use cases that are pretty simple where, where a user might think, you know, why do I need to learn so many concepts just to do something simple? Mm -hmm. Okay. So we've done a lot of shows about Kubernetes. So if people yeah. are not familiar with Kubernetes and they're still a little bit confused, yeah. now might be a good time to stop this episode and go listen to some of the previous episodes about Kubernetes because we're going to talk about serverless now. And then we'll get into serverless and Kubernetes and the interactions between the two. Yeah. How do you describe serverless or functions as a service to people who have not heard of this paradigm? So... So I like functions as a service as the term more because it more specifically describes what we're doing. I think of functions as a service as, as doing two related things. One is that it tries to give you short-lived stateless compute without having to deal with turning your, your function into a service and figuring out how to deploy and scale it. And it also gives you the ability to to run that function only on demand. And in some sense, either in a billing sense or in a resource utilization sense, that function, it makes that function free when it's not being used. So if we're talking about AWS Lambda, then we're actually talking about billing when only when the function is being used. And if you're talking about something like Fission, then we're talking about memory and CPU usage only while the function is being used. So, and that in the aggregate leads you to design your cluster capacity more as a function of how much your functions are being used rather than how many functions you've deployed, mm -hmm. right? So it's usage versus deployment size. And essentially, that's, that's another way of saying it's trying to drive up your cluster utilization. Mm -hmm. So when I run a function on AWS Lambda or Google Cloud functions, mm -hmm. I'm writing a piece of code mm 
and it's deploying against these clusters on Amazon or Google Cloud, what's actually going on there? We can't know for sure, <laughs> mm -hmm. but from what they've, you know, from from the level at which they've publicly spoken about it, at least for Lambda, they talk about having these, again, a pool of some compute resource. It's some kind of isolation environment, either a container with various knobs tweaked or, or a VM. I'm actually not sure how exactly a Lambda runs, but there's a pool of those. And one of those is then chosen and a function is loaded into that, into that entity, a container, a virtual machine, something like that. Mm -hmm. And then the request is routed into that function. So that function has some kind of wrapper for the language that's being supported. So I think Lambda supports JavaScript, Python natively. So each of those probably has some kind of wrapper. And then the JavaScript or Python function is called with the arguments that, that were sent in by either the request or an event. For years, when I started building a new app, I would use MongoDB. Now, I use MongoDB Atlas. MongoDB Atlas is the easiest way to use MongoDB in the cloud. It's never been easier to hit the ground running. MongoDB Atlas is the only database as a service from the engineers who built MongoDB. The dashboard is simple and intuitive but it provides all the functionality that you need. The customer service is staffed by people who can respond to your technical questions about Mongo. With continuous backup, VPC peering, monitoring, and security features, MongoDB Atlas gives you everything you need from MongoDB in an easy-to-use service. And you can forget about needing to patch your Mongo instances and keep it up to date, because Atlas automatically updates its version. Check out mongodb.com slash sedaily to get started with MongoDB Atlas and get $10 credit for free. And even if you're already running MongoDB in the cloud, Atlas makes migrating your deployment from another cloud service provider trivial with its live import feature. Get started with a free three-node replica set. No credit card is required. As an exclusive offer for Software Engineering Daily listeners, use code SEDAILY for $10 credit when you're ready to scale up. Go to mongodb.com slash SEDAILY to check it out. And thanks to MongoDB for being a repeat sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. It means a whole lot to us. And as I understand it, the way that people tend to think about AWS Lambda is Amazon has this big cluster of servers, and at any given time, they've got many of these servers that are allocated towards doing something, whether it's EC2 or S3 or it's serving some other purpose. Hmm. But at any given time, they've got excess capacity, and something like AWS Lambda can just absorb this excess capacity and be used to run functions. And that whether that's true or not, it makes sense to think of it that way because that helps to motivate why it's so cheap. So these things are super cheap. So there's the cost efficiency of running against the serverless architecture, but there's also the, the manageability and the scalability advantages to running against these serverless paradigms. Why is serverless useful? Why is there, to what degree is there a cost reduction and to what degree does this actually help developers manage their code? Those are two great questions. One is about cost and the other is about manageability, right? So let's dive into the cost argument a little bit. So the cost of Lambda itself the benefits come from from two sources. One is that your service, it depends on your utilization. If you have very varied utilization and you have long periods where 
your service isn't used at all, then that's where you're, you're getting build zero, right? And that's where a lot of your savings come from. But you can try this math. Go to Amazon's pricing page for EC2 and their pricing page for Lambda. And let's say there's the cheapest instance of Lambda is 128 megs. So find the pricing for an EC2 VM and imagine that you're running a Lambda 24 seven. The price for that does not compare favorably to the EC2 VM. It is quite a bit more expensive, except for the free tier that Lambda gives you. So that's where there are two cost-saving things from AWS Lambda. And, you know, we're diving into the details of AWS pricing a bit, but what I'm trying to get at is that the cost savings for Lambda come from being able to not pay when you're not using the service, but they don't work well for you if your service is being used all the time. So it's more useful when you have unpredictable usage. The other thing you pointed out is excess capacity, right? So there's things like spot instances and on Google Cloud, they have something called preemptible instances. And that seems to be a way where they try to sell excess capacity in the form of virtual machines. And there's been a lot of talk of running Kubernetes on such virtual machines. And that may give you the price benefits for those, for that excess capacity for Kubernetes. And then, you know, because those instances can actually get killed, they are very, they fit well into the model of running short-lived stateless things like fission on it. Mm -hmm. So I wondered a bit, but to answer your cost point, I think there is a cost benefit to the hosted serverless things like Lambda and Google Cloud, but you have to do the math for your use case before figuring out how much of a cost benefit there might be. And often there, there just isn't a cost benefit. Mm -hmm. Secondly, you talked about manageability, right? Yeah, so this is a really growing field. I think if you look as usage increases for serverless, in particular on Lambda, there's, there's been this whole bunch of new products coming around, coming up around AWS Lambda, an ecosystem of both open source and hosted services that will help you manage things from versioning and deployment to monitoring. And I think serverless sort of moves your abstraction layer and you've sort of traded some manageability problems for others. So now, for example, if you get rate limited by AWS, you don't, you need some sort of monitoring to know why, or you may have your functions itself scaling very well, but other parts of your infrastructure are slowing down. So you need some kind of deep monitoring and observation tools into your infrastructure to figure out where things are slow if they become slow. Does that make sense? Yes, it does make sense. We had Mike Roberts on the show, and yeah. he has written a lot about serverless architectures. And by that, I mean how you structure your application such that you can use AWS Lambda. And he talked about some patterns like using an API gateway and these other things that are abstractions that exist on from the AWS point of view. Like this is something that you yeah. build. This is an, an AWS abstraction, the API gateway. There's other things. No matter if you're on AWS and you're using Lambda or you're on Google Cloud and you're using Google Cloud Functions or you're on Azure and you're using Azure Cloud Functions, all of these things things kind of have the same property where when you make a request, your code gets spun up on some right. server thing somewhere, whether it's a server or a container, yeah. it gets run, and then that transient entity, that transient container or VM gets spun down. So the question that I have for you before we dive into talking about fission, yeah. when people are building on these hosted serverless platforms like Azure Cloud Functions or AWS Lambda, how do they manage long-running state? Because, you know, usually when I'm on Facebook or I'm on Gmail, hmm. I'm, you know, I leave my Gmail window open in some tab and then I go off and do something else and then I come back to it and I want to be able to continue using my Gmail yeah. and the server-side picture of that probably looks like a container that's spun up and that's you know, indexed my emails and can serve me information quite quickly. Yeah. You know, if Gmail were trying to serve to me using serverless architecture, mm 
it's hard to imagine how exactly that would work, what the persistence model would look like, because the actual compute node is getting spun up and then spun down as soon as it has nothing to do. So right. how do people typically treat persistence when they're yeah. building on these platforms? Yeah, so, you know, one of the, the big lessons of the the whole cloud native and 12-factor and app stuff is that when developing your application, you separate the things that need to persist either in memory or on stable storage from the business logic that you might, that actually operates on that state. And the big advantage of, of separating essentially compute from state is that you can scale those things separately. You can do rolling updates without losing state. And really stuff like Kubernetes deployments and you know replica sets and the rolling updates that they support, they kind of depend on, on this idea of separating out your state. So if you need persistent, long-lived memory state, then you simply keep it separately from your serverless functions. So for example, you might run Redis in a either in a long-lived container or in a virtual machine, or you use Postgres in a VM and it has its own internal caching and queries can be pretty fast, again, depending on use case. But the, the core idea is that you separate persistent state out of your compute. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, now that we've talked about Kubernetes a bit, we've talked about serverless a bit. Yeah. Let's talk about serverless on Kubernetes. Explain what your project is. Fission is. Right. So Fission lets you run functions as a service on Kubernetes. We actually started it about, let's say, it was in November 2016 that we first open sourced it. The reason we started it was that Platform 9 took Kubernetes to new users, you know, from the enterprise and OpenStack world and things like that. And they were having difficulty with the learning curve for using Kubernetes. So, so we wanted to give them something where they can bring a piece of code and, you know, on their first day of having a Kubernetes cluster, make a useful service run on it. So really one big goal of ours was making the initial use case use of Kubernetes really simple. And there's also the idea of basically making resource allocation more efficient, as we've talked about it extensively, the idea of invoking functions only when, only when there is demand for that function. So what Fission does is basically it uses the Kubernetes APIs. It hides the idea of containers from the user. And Fission gives users only, only three concepts. One is a function. That's a piece of code in, in any of the supported languages. There's JavaScript, Python, C Sharp, Go, Java. I might be missing one or two. And then there's the concept of environments, which is the language specific part of that function's invocation, of that function's execution. And there's the concept of triggers, which is how a function is invoked. So you can have an HTTP trigger, so you can tie a function to an HTTP request, or you can have a timer, and you can also invoke functions from events generated from Kubernetes itself. So you can use a function to watch, for example, new services. So anytime a new Kubernetes service is created, that function would be invoked. And so just by learning three concepts, the user can immediately start doing something useful. There's a command line tool and a UI as well. And they can write a function, map it to an environment. So, you know, they can say, okay, the JavaScript function runs in the JavaScript environment. And then they can map that function to some trigger. And it will only be invoked when that trigger is, when that trigger is activated. Here it's worth coming back to the two things that we discussed, cost and manageability, I yeah. think particularly manageability, because that is the thrust of why you would want to run Fission on top of your Kubernetes. So, you know, we talked at the beginning about some of the frustrations of running a Kubernetes cluster. What Fission does is it, instead of having the AWS Lambda or Google Cloud Functions world where when you execute your code against the giant you know capacity that AWS Lambda has available yeah. and then they do all the scheduling and you don't know what it does and it's a black box yeah. 
Fission allows you to do this with your own semantics, or at least you know what the semantics of Fission are, or at least you can look into it if you want. So yeah. you have more clarity on how the, you know, when you write your function to be executed serverlessly, you know how that scheduling works. So give us some more of the motivation for why we would want to self-host this ability, because, you know, the, coming back to the cost... Right. If it's so cheap to run our functions as a service on AWS Lambda, yeah. and probably they're going to give us a pretty good SLA, even if we don't know exactly what's going on under the hood, yeah. at least we get a good SLA, at least we know it's going to take a certain amount of time. Why would we want to self-host the ability to have a serverless architecture built on top of Kubernetes? That's a totally fair question. Like you said, you get a lot of visibility. Since the whole stack is open source, from Fission to Kubernetes to Linux, you can you can examine and monitor at every level when a function is slow. Secondly, to look at Lambda itself, they do have rate limiting and stuff like that. So in particular, rate limiting can be pretty interesting from a, from a user's point of view. The third thing is, again, the cost. If you are using your functions enough, if you're running them continuously, then in fact, it's much cheaper to run a functions as a service as a pattern on top of EC2 or compute instances from, from any of the clouds. So, and the other, the sort of higher level point is that if you run functions as a service on, on, an, open, on an open source stack of products, basically Fission and Kubernetes, then You've made something that's portable, and you can. You've essentially made the the cloud very easy to to switch. So you've reduced your you've reduced your your lock in in some sense to any particular cloud. Okay. So basically, it's portability, open source, and depending on use case, cost. Right. Right. Okay. So you've successfully convinced me that there's a motivation to doing this. So let's diagnose how you do it. In order to run these functions as a service on a Kubernetes cluster, right. you need to always keep a pool of running generic pods. So these are yep. pods where, and by the way, for those who are not familiar with Kubernetes lingo, a pod is an abstraction around a container or it can contain multiple containers, I believe, right? It's, right, just, an, right. it's just the abstraction of a Kubernetes unit. So these generic pods you know, if I write some function that I want to be executed as a function as a service against my serverless on Kubernetes cluster, the fission, my, my fission architecture, my fission cluster, mm -hmm. that's going to get scheduled on one of these generic pods. So yeah. tell me more about these generic pods. What are the requirements for these pods? Right. So first of all, why do they exist? So to go back to, to the idea of FAS, right, we want to activate a function on demand because we don't want to use resources when it's not running. However, users want to pretend that the function is always there, right? So that you don't have to pay much of a penalty for invoking that function, especially if, if there's a human being waiting for that function. The moment you take a noticeable amount of time, you know, people feel that the app is slow or something like that. So we need to satisfy both goals. We need to invoke the function only when it's in demand, and we need to make sure that we can invoke it really quickly when it is required. So first, we actually tried a simpler approach, which is, you know, when there's a request, put the the function in a in a container image, and then call Kubernetes to invoke that container image and run it as a container on the cluster somewhere. But this, at best, takes a few seconds. So while that's good enough for some use cases. It's not good enough for anything that's interactive where you have a person waiting for that function. So the next approach was, okay, what's the minimum we can do at runtime when a function is invoked? So we said, okay, we need, we need something that's already running and scheduled on Kubernetes, and we want to be able to drop a function into that at runtime. Now, those running things need to be language-specific because, because they have to dynamically load either a Node.js or a Python or, or a function of some sort. So for each supported language, we have 
we have these environments. And the environment basically causes a pool of these pods to be created. And the environment is just a container image that knows that knows two things. It knows how to dynamically load a function and it knows how to route HTTP requests into the function. So let's say you, you add JavaScript to your Fission cluster. You add the JavaScript environment or, or rather you enable the JavaScript environment on your Fission cluster. Then Fission goes and creates a pool of a few of these generic pods and that pod is in a state where it's just waiting for a request from fission to to load a given function and and to route a request into it mm -hmm. that pool of pods is eagerly created when you add when you add that environment to fission so when you invoke the function that pool is always available mm -hmm. and as we said a pod is an abstraction that can have multiple containers in it so yeah. are there are there any sidecar containers that you want to put in that pod yeah. along with the container that's just going to handle the execution of that serverless function? Yes, we, we do. So so a pod is basically a co-located set of containers. And the advantage of them being co-located is that you can share temporary file system space, for example. So in Fission, we try to divide the language-specific and the language-independent parts. And to make the language specific parts really small, we have a fission specific and language independent sidecar with every environment. And that sidecar knows how to get a function from fission's function store and make it accessible to the language specific container using a shared volume. And then to poke that language specific container to load that, to load the function. Artificial intelligence is dramatically evolving the way that our world works. And to make AI easier and faster, we need new kinds of hardware and software, which is why Intel acquired Nirvana Systems and its platform for deep learning. Intel Nirvana is hiring engineers to help develop a full stack for AI, from chip design to software frameworks. Go to softwareengineeringdaily.com slash intel to apply for an opening on the team. To learn more about the company, check out the interviews that I've conducted with its engineers. Those are also available at softwareengineeringdaily.com slash intel. Come build the future with Intel Nirvana. Go to softwareengineeringdaily.com slash intel to apply now. Yeah, that makes sense. So, so quick question. You know, I've got, let's say I've got my Kubernetes cluster and I've got certain things that I want to continue to do on Kubernetes. I want to have these certain long-running containers across my application, but I now have a new feature that I'm building. It's an image resizing feature. This is, this is the classic yep. example that's used for serverless. So if I want to, you know, get an image resized serverless is great for that because image resizing is a well-formed stateless thing okay i need to resize my image so i container gets spun up to do the image resizing it gets done i get my resized image back and then that container gets spun down or garbage collected somehow so if i am creating if i want to create my serverless area of my of my cluster or of my of my Kubernetes yeah my Kubernetes cluster my fission area that does things like image resizing what's the interaction between the fission area of my Kubernetes cluster and the rest of my Kubernetes cluster that's a great question and it it really brings up the it sort of brings home the fact that you you can mix together microservices and functions as a service patterns easily on Kubernetes you don't have to have a separate area as such for functions. And you can invoke functions today by HTTP and pretty shortly through a variety of message queues. So is your question around how you invoke functions from regular services? It's more around the, what is the sharing? So I've got capacity of X for my yes. entire Kubernetes cluster. Yes. And if I, if I want to, 
partition off some of that capacity for fission yeah and and fission takes up y mm-hmm. then you know how am i moving resources between those two resource spaces and hmm. you know what how much does fission take care of it sounds like that it sounds like they play pretty nice together yeah and again that's the advantage of living on top of kubernetes we get to use all of their the primitives that they provide so for example Kubernetes provides namespaces and you can run all of your functions in one namespace and provide an an upper limit for CPU and memory. And that will make sure that your functions never cross that limit. And so your other resources can have the remaining cluster resources. To recap a bit, Kubernetes gives you allows you to specify CPU requests and limits, I think on a per pod basis and on a per namespace basis, it lets you specify a total quota. You can organize this any way you want. You can you can have your apps in the names each app in a namespace, or you can divide your namespace according to how your company's organization is, and you can then provide resource allocation limits using namespaces. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I've heard of the cold start problem on yeah. serverless systems, and this describes the problem where. If I make a request to AWS Lambda or Google Cloud Functions and it needs to spin up a container containing my code somewhere on the cluster, it takes some time to spin up that container and execute my request. How does the cold start problem manifest in Fission? Right. So we have exactly the same problem, right? When a request hasn't come in for a given function for a while, the first time it comes in, we have to invoke this function. And that's where that pool of generic pods is useful. So Fission deals with cold start by, so let me break up the components of Fission a little bit. There's a router, which is where HTTP requests come in. And there's a pool manager, which is what manages this pool of generic pods and knows how to load a function into, into a pod. So the request comes into the router the router checks if there's already a, a pod for that function. And since this is a cold start, there's there's nothing existing yet. So it sends a request, it sends a request to the pool manager to to create a pod for that function that's been requested. The pool manager then chooses a pod from that generic pool. It removes it from the pool and loads a function into it by, by actually calling that sidecar that we talked about earlier. And once that once that pod is ready, it returns control to the router, which then caches that pod's address and forwards the HTTP request. It, it just creates an HTTP proxy and forwards the request to that pod. So that process, depending on the language and the size of function, takes on the order of 100 milliseconds. Sometimes it can be a lot faster depending on the, again, the contents of the function. And then that pod is cached for a while, for a few minutes, and the router is keeping track of how often that, or when the last time was that the pod was invoked, that the function was invoked. And if a function hasn't been invoked for a while, then that pod is just stilled. And so the next invocation of that would be a cold start again. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I want to talk about schedulers a little bit. So Kubernetes has a built-in scheduler Mm -hmm that actually I don't know much about it, but hmm. I know that if I make a request for to Kubernetes for a container, that request is somehow going to get scheduled against the resources that I have available, and my request is going to get matched up with a blob of resources that will turn into my container for me. Can you talk more about the how the built-in scheduler for Kubernetes works and how that lines up with the scheduling requirements that you have for Fission? You know, I'm not an expert on Kubernetes okay. scheduling. Yeah, sorry. Not a problem. I don't want to hand wave my way through <laughs> through something well, that's uh, a lot well, more to precise. Me, to, me, to me, that's yeah. al- that's almost interesting. It, yeah. It's interesting that you don't need to be an ex- expert on Kubernetes scheduling to build right. a serverless environment on top of it. Because serverless is this big scheduling problem because like AWS yes. Lambda, for example, yeah. they've got you know tons of requests for serverless yeah. execution coming in at any given time. Right. And they've got to schedule those requests yes. against 
different blobs of resources around their right. their gigantic network of data centers. Yeah. So how does that relate to the scheduling that you have to build for phishing? We actually completely, well, okay. So again, this comes down to scheduling the size of the pool. There's a few problems in this area and some of them are scheduling, right? So let's just list out the questions that affect the scheduling of a request onto some physical compute resource. There's the size of the generic pool. There's the scheduling of the generic pool itself. There's a question of how we choose a pod from the pool for a function. And then just today, we had a bunch of questions from a user about federation, and we haven't even really started about federation. So, so I'm going to keep it to one cluster for a moment. And then there's stuff like auto scaling. When you have lots of load for one function, how do you manage that? So to answer all of those questions, first, the size of the pool. Today in Fission, it's static which obviously only works for a certain a certain rate of incoming requests, incoming cold starts rather. And it works well enough for a certain size of deployment and you can tweak that static size of the pool. But we will eventually have to work on dynamically changing the size of that pool. So it's not directly a scheduling problem, but that's something we have to do. Secondly, the scheduling of the generic pods onto nodes. That's something that we leave entirely to Kubernetes. And we don't really have to do anything spe function specific there. One thing that's a bit of an unsolved problem for, for fission on Kubernetes is that because we keep this pool of functions so that cold start is fast, they need to have their CPU and memory usage defined before a function comes in, right? So if a function has a different CPU and memory requirement from what the, the pod was scheduled with, we can't change that pod's requirement. So there's a, you know, a complicated set of tasks that, that we're doing there, but generally the idea is that Kubernetes does the scheduling of generic pods onto the cluster, and then Fission schedules functions into that pool. And to schedule functions into that pool, we simply choose randomly because we don't keep too many pods active that are idle. And the assumption is that Kubernetes has chosen a good place already for, for any function that might run in those pods. And so as long as we uniformly spread out functions over the pool, we are okay. Mm. And so testing on, on smallish clusters has shown that this is fine, but there's a lot more testing to do. We haven't merged our auto scaling into, into the main release yet. And there there's, there's another, so for auto scaling, we no longer use the pool. We actually create a deployment. Now Kubernetes lets you, lets you move pods from one deployment to another by changing labels. So you can orphan a pod from a deployment and adopt it into another one. And then Kubernetes own auto scaling logic can handle the auto scaling of a function pod once it's in a deployment, mm -hmm. right? So auto scaling work in Fission is basically letting Kubernetes autoscaler do the right thing with a function. Right. So the reason I haven't gone a whole lot into Kubernetes own scheduler is that we, um, it's just a question of maturity. We haven't yet gone to a large scale testing and high performance stuff, but that's something we will do eventually. Certainly. Well, I did a show about schedulers with Adrian Cockcroft a while ago, mm -hmm. and it was that was that was a great episode. I really enjoyed talking to Adrian. Of course, he's kind of a legendary figure, yeah. and he just had a lot to say about scheduling and a lot of historical context. But it's a problem that never gets solved. It's it's because scheduling a set of resources against a set of tasks is just an impossibly complex problem. Yeah. So that's why. Netflix has their own scheduler, right. why Kubernetes has its own scheduler, yes. why your CPU has its own scheduler, and scheduling is just a thing that has to get solved at every layer of the stack in right. different ways. Yeah, true. And we might be, since your function invocations in general are maybe an order of magnitude or more, more than regular pod schedulings, we might be loading the scheduler quite a bit. So that's something we'll have to we'll have to test and see how it works. But on the other hand, functions being pure compute and not caring where they get scheduled for the most part, 
is helpful. So they won't have a lot of, you know, functions usually won't have node affinity or things like that. It's mostly just saying, find me some CPU and memory to run this function. Mm -hmm. Right. What applications have you written that use Fission? So at Platform 9, we're doing, we're using it for a few internal applications. There's a couple of bots that are used in our DevOps channel for managing some of our CI CD infrastructure. So someone wrote a bot where you can just pause all tests or restart them if you're doing something to the underlying infrastructure. And they didn't want to stand up a whole service just for this bot. So they quickly wrote a function, wired it up to Slack webhooks, and they were on their way. We also use it for, for webhooks, again, from our CI CD infrastructure and creating these dashboards that are used internally. We're hosting some external facing apps for our customers using using Fission. And those are again, those contain some interactive forms. So it's important that, that we are able to start a function on time. Uh, so again, the cold start problem shows up there. Mm -hmm. And we've had users tell us uh, a lot about how they're using. We have many users who are interested in, in the Kubernetes watch functionality. So Kubernetes has something called a watch, which is where you can specify a set of resources, pods, services, deployments, anything like that. And you can watch them, which means you get an alert anytime something in that set is added, removed, or modified. Mm. And this is a nice use case to wire up Fission to. Normally, you'd write, a, you'd write your own controller using the Go Kubernetes client. And that's a certain amount of work. And you have to learn how to do that. And then you would run that service on Kubernetes. But with Fission, you can just write one command and say, okay, watch the set of pods in so-and-so namespace and invoke so-and-so function on the contents of that pod whenever it changes. So so the, the resource gets serialized into JSON and the function gets called with that JSON. And you can do things like, oh, if a new service is launched with a certain annotation, you can go wire it up to your own infrastructure's load balancer or something like that. Mm -hmm. So you can do custom behavior on Kubernetes resources. Mm -hmm. So the examples you talked about are, you know, the, like the first ones you gave with the the chat bots yeah. that are able to execute, you know, some CI simple CI CD stuff. Yeah. And then you know the example I gave of the image resizing. Yeah. These are fairly small compute yeah. problems, but I can easily imagine wanting to spin up a serverless function to, for example, serve a machine learning model. And maybe I've just got a few requests that I need to serve to this machine learning model and then it gets discarded. Yes. Have you talked to anybody that, I mean, whether you're, you want to talk about machine learning or yeah. some other heavier service, right, what are right. the heavier services, the bigger, bulkier services that you've talked to people about yeah. running on serverless? Yeah, so, so there's interest in running video encoding on Fission, for example. And that's, again, a compute-heavy task. And the idea is mm. that you there's some storage system, S3, or, or really any storage system, where you dump a large video file into it. And then it's similar in, you know, to the image resizing case. Really, it's the same thing, but for video. So when that video lands in the storage system, you invoke the video encoding function, and you get a video that's suitable for various kinds of devices and screen resolutions that's poured back into the storage system. So there's interest in that, that dependent on our auto scaling landing. So there's some, you know, we're, we're pre-beta, which is why all our use cases are kind of glue and automation kind of stuff <laughs> for now. And in fact, that's, that's kind of how these kind of frameworks start, right? Because those mm -hmm. are the areas where you're willing to experiment. Yep. So it's internal. If the chatbot misbehaves, then you can go fix it because it's an internal app. And we expose some of this to customers, and that's carefully managed cluster and things like that, of course. But we come with a don't use it in production label for now. So once we have some of these core features like auto scaling, and uh, we can talk more about our roadmap in a bit, but there's a few features that, that need to be in there before we can do things that, that are heavier in compute, like mm. machine learning, video encoding, mm. stuff like that. Mainly it's auto-scaling and workflows around functions, how we manage function upgrades and so on. Mm. There are some other serverless on Kubernetes implementations out there. 
Have you yeah. talked to the other people that are building serverless on Kubernetes implementations? Have you seen any interesting design decisions that they've done differently? I haven't spoken a whole lot. So there's two that I know of. There's Function from Red Hat and there's Kubeless from uh, Sebastian, Sebastian G. I've spoken to Sebastian early on. Something they did differently is that they chose not to have a pool of generic functions, mm. which allows them to... So basically, they create a pod whenever a function is invoked. Yep. And I think you know that gives them... That's a different trade-off. You, you lose the cold start time, but you can specify a pod at startup time. And so I guess you, it's easier to do things like specifying uh, CPU limits when you don't have a pod that's already running. Mm-hmm. That seems like a, actually a, a good thing that there are two different approaches that right. are that are because th- that's a that's a distinctly different approach with a distinctly different scheduler strategy that you might have. So you could imagine having a Kubernetes cluster where you have both kubeless and fission. Well, maybe, but maybe uh, <laughs> who knows? So, so I think the execution strategy is is one part of of the whole fast system, right? And in fact, we've talked a bit about, we go a little bit back and forth on this in Fission, and we've talked about really just having a a pluggable execution strategy. So if your function is such that it does not care about the cold start time, but does care a whole lot about features that you can only get by starting a pod on demand, then we could just map that function to to be invoked as a new pod instead of using the pool. The reason we might want to do that so, you know, the other features of Fission, like language environments and the various triggers that are going to be supported, we don't want users to have to say, okay, I can either use this language and this trigger and I can get, you know, users will have to make strange choices about, about what features are available to them. So I think the execution strategy is one part of, of FAS and it's plausible that we'll implement multiple strategies. What else? I think they also bundle Kafka with... Mm. So we're working on event queue integration as well. Mm. And we can talk quite a lot about events. And in fact, right now we just support HTTP, time triggers based on cron strings and Kubernetes watches. But we're working on support for a message queue called NATS. NATS is designed as this easy to deploy and operate with tunable persistent settings, at least once message queue. So it sounds like a very nice set of properties. And we're working on asynchronous invocation of functions using that. And really, there's different deployments have different message queues that they use, you know, that are completely dependent on their use case. So for example, heavy users of AWS probably use SNS and SQS because S3 plugs into it very well. And so so we'll be adding support for a few different message queues as well. Hmm. I've spoken to some of the other implementations early on. We tried to see if there was a way to, to work on one project instead of multiple, but we didn't seem to find one. Uh-huh. So that's where we are. I think, you know, in general, it, as you go higher in the abstraction levels of the stack, you get people who who do things differently, who have different opinions, right? And Mm -hmm. users end up having to, users kind of have to make the choice of what higher level framework to use. Mm -hmm. I think this happens a lot, for example, as you go all the way up in the stack, there's like 10,000 JavaScript frameworks, right? So, and each of them has has certain good properties. And I think ultimately users will take their use case and try to map it into each of these frameworks and see which one fits. Well, in the JavaScript case, you know, yeah. we had a ton of frameworks, and then React came out, and mm-hmm. React has become the most popular one. Mm-hmm. And but it's interesting because there were lots of frameworks before. So for all we know, we're only at the beginning of the serverless on Kubernetes uh, frameworks. You know, maybe there'll yeah. be many more to come. Who knows how deep this yeah. space goes? It's really hard to tell at this point. Yeah, it's an early space for sure, and there's a lot, lot more ahead than mm-hmm. than what's already been created. Mm-hmm. So yeah, okay, I totally to, expect there to be more. Yeah. So to wrap up, you work at Platform Nine, and Platform Nine, we we yeah. didn't talk about that much, but that is a a higher level control plane on top of 
Kubernetes. I think you can use it with other platform as a service things, maybe, or is it just maybe just right. Kubernetes? It actually started as an OpenStack control plane. Right. Yeah. So it started three ish years ago. And the idea was that people have all these on prem deployments of hardware and they're finding it really hard to to manage all that stuff. So Platform 9 created this sort of slick control plane. You just drop one agent onto onto your machines and you can run virtual machines using using the UI or the CLIs and it deploys OpenStack. Mm -hmm. And for about a year and a half, we've also been deploying Kubernetes for users, both on-prem and in the cloud. And so there, you know, the, the idea is more or less the same, that they have some compute resources and we want to let users use their compute resources either as virtual machines or containers. And there's lots of ways in which those things interact. For example, authorization, you want the same set of users' credentials to be usable with both OpenStack and Kubernetes APIs. So, so that's something Platform 9 does. And it also gives you a single UI that, that lets you look at usage in both OpenStack and Kubernetes deployments. And so if I'm a user of Platform 9 and I'm using it to interface with my Kubernetes cluster, why is Fission important to me? So Fission itself works on any Kubernetes cluster, and we've somewhat deliberately made a choice not to not to have anything Platform 9 specific in it, right? It's, it's open source, and we're not trying to tie Platform 9 to Fission, but... Uh, any Kubernetes user, we hope, will find Fission useful for a set of use cases that fit well into the FAS model. Now we'll do some things that are sort of, that make it easy for users to use this stuff on their Platform 9 managed Kubernetes cluster. So we have in the Platform 9 UI, a little web CLI, which gives you the kubectl Kubernetes CLI and the Helm CLI for, for installing packages onto your Kubernetes cluster. And then you can just use that to set up Fission. Today, again, we don't tie Fission into the product in any way, but you can just Helm install Fission and we could drop the Fission CLI also into that into mm. that web-based CLI. Yeah. So you have an easy, a really quick way to get started with your cluster. Yeah. Cool. Well, so I'm, I want to thank you for coming on Software Engineering Daily. I'm we're up against time. And it's, yeah. been, it's been really enjoyable talking to you. Yeah, thanks so I much mean, for having me. You, you want to maybe close off by saying what's on the roadmap, what's on the horizon for Fission? Yes. So we have a few a few areas for the Fission roadmap. I'll try to keep it short, but broadly the areas are development workflows, versioning functions, versioning a group of functions, doing rolling upgrades, things like that, managing testing. Then there's the area of composition of functions and making more complex systems using functions. So doing workflows, synchronous and asynchronous composition of functions, again, versioning a set of functions and while a workflow is proceeding through those functions. Then there's features around the ingress into functions, so authentication, authorization, stuff like that. And there's the whole ops space around functions, so better observability, tracing, integration, exception tracking, stuff like that. And we track our roadmap. I'm going to redirect you to, to our GitHub project to look more deeply into our roadmap it's at github.com slash fission slash fission cool all right well well so thanks for coming on the show it's been a pleasure talking to you thanks jeff thanks so much for having me great talking to you too yeah great conversation okay cool <laughs> you have a full-time engineering job you work on back-end systems or front-end web development but the device that you interact with the most is your smartphone, and you want to know how to program it. You could wade through online resources and create your own curriculum from the tutorials and the code snippets that you find online, but there's a more efficient option than teaching yourself. If you want to learn mobile development from great instructors for free, check out CodePath. CodePath is an eight-week iOS and Android development class for professional engineers who are looking to build a new skill. CodePath has free evening classes for dedicated, experienced engineers and designers. I can personally vouch for the effectiveness of the CodePath program because I just hired someone full-time from CodePath to work on my company, ad for prize He was a talented engineer before he joined CodePath, 
But the free classes that CodePath offered him allowed him to develop a new skill, which was mobile development. With that in mind, if you're looking for talented mobile developers for your company, CodePath is also something you should check out. So whether you're an engineer who is looking to retrain as a mobile developer, or if you're looking to hire mobile engineers, go to CodePath.com to learn more. You can also listen to my interview with Nathan Esquinazzi of CodePath to learn more. And thanks to the team at CodePath for sponsoring Software Engineering Daily and for providing a platform that is useful to the software community. 